We're delighted again to uh, have here with us Cardinal Koch and anyone who was uh, uh, here yesterday and uh, heard his uh, wonderful address to us on the occasion of receiving the Ladislao Ola Latz uh, uh, Award. Um, it was, it was very, very uh, impressive and uh, uh, moving, and indeed the panel afterwards as, as well was uh, uh, intellectually stimulating, intellectually and spiritually, I think, stim stimulating. This morning, what we wanted to do, and what I, I hope uh, will happen, was to actually uh, think about the question of Christianity, Judaism, Judaism and the other, and we thought to start out with uh, sort of sermons, well, kind of sermons, sermons in an, in an academic uh, uh, setting. And we asked uh, both uh, uh, Cardinal Koch and uh, Rabbi Alon Goshen Gottstein, who is sitting next to the Cardinal here, to uh, uh, present uh, ideas about Christianity and the other, and Judaism, and Judaism as, uh, as the other, and the other, sorry. Um, for those of you who were here yesterday and, are, and already know who the Cardinal and have been introduced to the Cardinal, I will again give a short introduction for those who weren't. And uh, the Cardinal Koch right, it was born in uh, Switzerland in 1950. He's, uh, he has a doctorate in theology. Uh, uh, he studied theology at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and, and then at the University of Luzern where he got a doctorate of uh, theology. He, became, he was ordained to the priesthood in 1982. From 1995, Cardinal Koch was elected, was the Bishop of Basel. And in 2010, he was appointed by Pope Benedict XVI president, as president of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, working, together, working towards ecumen ecumenism. In other words, bringing together the different strands of the Christian denominations. And in this capacity, he also leads, he's also the president of the Commission of the Holy See for Religious Relations with the Jews. And Cardinal Koch was uh, uh, also one of the cardinal electors who participated in the 2013 papal conclave that elected Pope Francis. As we heard yesterday, Cardinal Koch was very, very, uh, uh, is very, very, uh, an important, sorry, Cardinal Koch is an import, plays an important role in the dialogue between Christians and Jews, and we're delighted to have him here with us, and please, would you come and uh, speak to us? Mr. Dean, ladies and gentlemen, when we speak about Christianity, we have to start with Jesus Christ. Jesus is his name, Christ is the title that means in Greek, the anointed one, which corresponds to Messiah. Christians believe that Jesus is the Messiah of Israel, the Son of God. But without doubt, he was Jewish and raised according to the Jewish tradition of his time. Jesus was a Jew by faith, a Jew in his ethical rigor, in his love for the Torah, in his fondness for extended metaphors and parables, and in the apocalyptic urgency of his teaching. Jesus' Jewishness is essential to Christianity. To Christians, Jesus was the Messiah, itself a Jewish concept, whose coming had been foretold in Jewish scripture for centuries. Christians believe that it is Jewish history that Jesus fulfills. For Christians, Jesus was there well before his actual coming in the fervid longing, longings of a people who had suffered exile, dispossession, and at the time of Jesus, occupation under the Romans. Jesus is also the Son of God, but not in the sense of a human father and a son. Jesus is God's Son in the sense that he is God made manifest in human form. Jesus is God's Son in that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, an angel is announced to Mary, the earthly mother of Jesus. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Taking this into account, 
one can ask what is Christianity about. In the center of this religion, there is first of all not a set of doctrinal statements or rules, nor a code of behavior, but a living person, Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And what is the essence of Christianity? The center of Christianity is the death and resurrection of Jesus. Everything else in the New Testament, whether it be a command to love others or to keep ourselves pure from sin or any other topic, stems from the death and resurrection of Jesus. Everything Jesus himself said and did revolved around this. If we take that away, Christianity has no foundation, no basis. Without a thorough appreciation of the centrality of the death of the crucified Jesus and his resurrection, one will never truly learn how to live the Christian life. Christianity is possible only because Jesus died and was raised. Without his death, there would be no forgiveness for the sins. And without his resurrection, there would now be hope of eternal life. If Jesus had remained in his tomb, one would have no reason to pay attention to anything he said. Furthermore, the death and resurrection is not just a historical event. It is much more. It is the pattern by which a Christian has to live. Being Christ-like means living a life that is characterized by death to sin and new life for God. Christians die to sin and are buried with Christ in baptism. Then they are arised out of the water of to life in a new life, to live in a new life with him. As disciples of Christ, Christians must follow him in the way of the cross, the way of sacrifice, the way of dying unto sin in obedience to the will of God. Every other moral command in the New Testament is simply spelling out how a crucified and resurrected person ought to live. Christians must be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I said, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Crucified with him and living a new life with him, that is the essence of being a Christian. Being a Christian means that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is decisive about how to live and how to conduct the life according to the will of God. Thus, approaching the question, who is the other for Christians, first it should be understood who was the other for Jesus. In the New Testament, we find the following story. And behold, a laborer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered right, to this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him, and departed, leaving him half dead. No by chance a priest was going down to the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the, other, on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion and went to him and bound up his wounds, puring on oil and wine. The, he set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And the next day he took out two dinner, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, 
And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. This would mean that the neighbor, the other one, is first of all a person in need, who depends on the help of other people, the poor, the sick, the old and handicapped, the homeless, the prisoner, the beggar, the people at the margin of society. In the Torah, one finds the two commandments to love God and to love the neighbor separately, but Jesus binds both together. By loving the people in need through visible char charitable deeds, one is demonstrating that he is also loving God. In this sense, God is love. Another New Testament text demonstrates this insight very clearly. The framework is here the last judgment. I quote, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place the sheep at his right hand but the goats at the left. Then the king will, the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, O blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was in prison and you come to me. Then the writers will answer him, Lord, when did we see thee hungry and feed thee? or thirsty and gave thee drink? And then did we see a stranger and welcome thee, or naked and clothed thee? And when did we see sick or in prison and visit thee? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. This would mean that somebody who takes care of a person in need is taking care of Jesus himself. It is in the face of the needy one that one recognizes the future of Christ himself. The story of the good Sam Samaritan who took care of the man who fell among robbers tells us also another thing. The other one is the stranger. Taking into account that the Jews at the time of Jesus did not get along with the Samaritans and saw them as alien, strangers with whom to should avoid any contact, it is very surprising that precisely a Samaritan who helps the wounded man. People of the Jewish establishment, like the priest and the Levite, passed by and were not willing to help the victim because they feared becoming impure. But in, his story, in this story, an unwelcome and hated stranger becomes the neighbor, the other one. And the person taking care of the afflicted man therefore fulfills the divine commandment. In the Old Testament, we learn about the stranger whom Abraham met and who became his guest. The reader of Genesis in the chapter 18 in the Old Testament, knows from the beginning of this story that the stranger is the Lord himself. Abraham took care of the stranger and he obtained from him the promises to have a son and to become a mighty nation. He believed in these promises and received his son Isaac through his wife Sarah, very old, advanced in age. He can be seen as the father of faith, because he relied exclusively on God's word. He left his country, his kindred, and his father's house to enter into the promised land, and he received the message that of him will be made a great and blessed nation. Having a deep faith means relying on God's word alone and leaving all behind. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his 
only son according to the commandment of God. This was a test of Abraham's faith. He obeyed in all to the voice of the Almighty. So he was rewarded by him. Because you have done this and have not withheld for your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is one of the sea store. Because Abraham trusted God fully, he became a model of faith, an example of obedience to the word of God. Therefore, to be children of Abraham would mean to imitate his faith, fixing ourselves in the promising word of God. Trusting in God alone and his word means to be children of Abraham. Pope John Paul II called the Jews our elder brothers in the face of Abraham. Christians and Jews are brothers. They have the same father and in a certain sense are raised in one family with the same traditions. The ways of brothers are the same ones during the first period of family life but then everybody has different ways to go. The face of our forefather Abraham in the one and unique God of Israel connects Jews and Christians. Yet at the same time, the Christian faith differs from other faiths by virtue of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, whom Christians confess as Messiah, come to the world to save all who belong to him. With the vocation of Abraham in the Bible, this history of salvation starts as family story, and God's beloved people have famous biblical figures as points of identification. The God of Israel is first represented as God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as God of the forefathers. Christians and Jews have the same God of Israel, but the way of perceiving this God in, is quite different. For Christians, the way to God cannot refrain from Jesus Christ because he himself is the way and the truth and the life. For Jews, God has revealed himself by his word given in the Torah and the way towards him consists in observing his commandments. Jesus is for Christians the word of God that become flesh and dwelt among us. If we speak of our common father in face Abraham, we have to take into account that our faiths are different, also we believe in the same God. In the New Testament, Jesus states that the children of Abraham are doing the same as what Abraham did. In the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John, the Jews were particularly called children of Abraham. It seems to be an honorable expression for religious Jews who are taking serious God's commandments. But there the figure of Abraham becomes relative to Jesus himself who claims to know God and to have seen Abraham. In John 80, 58, Jesus states, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This claim caused troubles among the Jews of the New Testament period because Jesus saw himself superior to Abraham. As for Christians today, the figure of Jesus Christ, Christ is more important than Abraham, because their whole destiny depends on the relationship to the only Son of God. They are baptized into Jesus Christ, into his death and resurrection, and they hope to be saved by and through him. If Christians are to be called children of Abraham, it should be taken into account that they belong first and primarily to Jesus Christ, who believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as a Jew of his times. Therefore, Christians can only be called children of Abraham if they show the same behavior as Abraham, the father of faith, who relied exclusively on God and his promising word. The term children of Abraham is not central for the Christian faith, so we share the faith of Abraham in the one and unique God. The faith of Abraham was also the faith of Jesus as Jew. 
He observed the commandments of the Torah and lived according to the religious traditions of his time. But the particular point of Christian faith is the belief in Jesus Christ as the word of God sent to our world to save all who belong to him. He is our living Torah that become flesh and through him God's plan of salvation will be realized. The figure of Abraham is important for Jews as well as for Christians, but they see it under different perspectives. The God of Abraham is also the God of Jesus. Thus, Jews and Christians share the same faith in God, who is not an unreachable ruler of heaven, heavens. He is the God of the covenant, the God of dialogue that turns to people as friends, speaks to them and with them. He loves his people and humankind, and he remains faithful to his love despite all human failures. He reaches out toward men, is committed in their history, and listens to their cries and suffering. He is especially with the poor and the oppressed. He is a sympathetic and empathetic God, a God that shares in the suffering, but is now overwhelmed by it and remains the sovereign God of history, guiding everything and leading everything towards his final kingdom. He lives both in heaven and among us human beings. Jews and Christians believe that God created man in his own image after his likeness, so that therefore every human person possesses an infinite dignity which deserves about absolute respect from his neighbor. The Bible affirms the sanctity and invaluable dignity of the human being, of every human being, regardless of his or her cultural, national or religious belonging. This universalistic biblical view is one of the very foundations and sources of modern theory and policy of human rights. This common heritage gives a common responsibility to Jews and Christians for the defense and promotion of human rights and of human life in the world. And this is the best we can do for peace and freedom in the world. Against all nationalistic narrowness and materialistic depreciation of the person, we have to insist on the dignity and greatness of the human being. We have to stand against the immoralities and idolatries that harm and degrade human dignity. But the Bible is thoroughly realistic. It knows the misery of the human being. It knows that our world is no paradise and speaks therefore of paradise lost, of hard labor, guilt, suffering and death, of enmity between individuals and between nations, of poverty, injustice, lies, defamation, and persecution, of the experience of meaninglessness and hopelessness. The Bible and both our religious tradition do not leave us alone with these feelings, for they speak of hope to the, due to the salvation. Between Christians and Jews, deep and fundamental differences remain. But despite all remaining differences, we have a common mission. It is more important to note after, after all that our differences are not too extreme as to prevent us from bearing common witness to the God of the covenant. Such common witness is particularly urgent in today's world, a world that has become secular and profane and often adapts the sense of life and history. It is our common task and mission to help people find sense, courage, and hope. Jews can show the path to true happiness in life through the way of the Torah, the Ten Commandments, which according to the Bible are not to be seen as burdens and limitations, but as guides and sign points to happiness and human fulfillment. Christians, however, can show the way to happiness by conducting a Christ-like life embedded in the mystery of his death and resurrection. Current scientific and technological progress have raised new and difficult ethical questions. 
As Jews and Christians, we possess an immense human, religious, and ethical potential against the great destructive potential in our world, potentials which can nevertheless help to build up a new civilization of life. We have therefore a common responsibility for the future in this century, as well as for the next generation. We should not only look back to the negative sides of our history. Today, we are called to look forward and initiate a new common history for the good of humankind. It is our deep conviction that Christians and Jews have embarked upon a new phase of their relationship. In the book of our common history, a new page has been opened. In our current situation, we can no longer afford to be apart from each other or fight with each other. As difficult as it may be, we must build bridges between us. Or better, we must dare to walk on bridges that have existed as long as we have existed as Jews and Christians. The Bible considers humans as dialogical beings in relation with God and in relation with one another. Not without good reason has it been that Jewish thinkers like Martin Buber have ardently proposed the paradigm of dialogical thought to a civilization marked by individualism and have inspired us to discern that it is in the countenance of the other in confronting the otherness of the other that we discover ourselves. Not only do we undertake dialogue, we are dialogue. Meanwhile, dialogue has become a fashionable byword grown shapely by our use. The word refer refers to ecumenical, interreligious, social, inner church, and also to Jewish Christian dialogue. Often such dialogue does not go beyond polite expression of friendliness. This is still better than violent dispute. But is there not also the danger of minimization of just tolerating each other, the risk of indifferentism, patchwork identity? In this sense, one does not or cannot authentically bear and respect the otherness of the other. The Jewish Christian dialogue cannot be of that kind. Jews and Christians, with all they have in common in their fundamental understandings, in the fundamental conception which are constitutive for their respective identities, are and remain different. This difference is concerned their religious convictions on the question of God and Christ, their notions of word, redemption, or otherwise. Therefore, we should not approach the Jewish Christian dialogue with naive expectation of a harmonious understanding. Yet, precisely when we do not simply mindedly ignore our otherness, but rather bear with it, can we learn from each other. There is considerable ignorance on both sides, and ignorance is one of the roots of reciprocal prejudice. Ultimately, Relations between Jews and Christians cannot be reduced to a simple formula, and even less so can it be raised to a higher synthesis. Franz Rosenzweig, for example, has spoken of a mutual completion. An image for the dialogue is found in the interpretation of the prophet Zechariah by rabbinical theology. The prophet looks into the messianic future where the peoples are taken into alliance with Israel. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. According to rabbinical interpretation of all us, Jews and all peoples will stand shoulder to shoulder. Only at the end of time shall historically indissoluble relation between Israel and the church find a solution. Until then, so they may not be united in one another's arms, neither should they turn their backs to each other. They should stand shoulder to shoulder as partners and in a world where the glimmer of hope has grown faint, together they must strive to radiate the light of hope without which no human being and no people can live. Young people, especially 
need this common witness to the hope of peace and justice and solidarity. Never again contempt, hatred, oppression, and persecution between races, between cultures, and between religions. Jews and Christians together can maintain this hope, for they can testify from the bitter and painful lessons of history that, despite otherness and foreignness and despite historical guilt, conversion, reconciliation, brotherhood, peace, and friendship are possible. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Cardinal Koch, for leading us down a fascinating uh, uh, path with such uh, kindness, gentleness, and sensitivity, and uh, for reminding us just uh, how much has changed in the last uh, uh, 50 years, but yet just how much still needs to be done in the, uh, in the uh, uh, future for reminding us that uh, through knowing the other and appreciating the other, we will know, we can know more about, we can know more about uh, ourselves. To me, uh, having you here in an Israeli university saying what you uh, said just shows us right, how, how much, how far we have come along the path of at least beginning to talk to each other, understand each other, and perhaps together create a better world. Thank you very much. I'm now delighted to invite Rabbi Alon Goshen Gottstein to uh, address us. Rabbi Goshen Gottstein is acknowledged as one of, the one of the world's leading figures in interreligious dialogue, specializing in bridging the theological and, academical, and academic dimension with a variety of practical initiatives, especially involving world religious leadership. He is, both a, he is both a theoretician and activist, setting trends and precedents in the global interfaith arena. He is the founder and director of the Elijah Interfaith Institute, formerly called the Elijah School for Study of Wisdom in World, in world Religions, and its rich website is testimony to his many and varied activities. A noted scholar of Jewish studies, he has held academic posts at Tel Aviv University and has served as director of the Center for the Study of Rabbinic Thought in the Bet Morasha College, Jerusalem. A multi-volume series of interfaith studies edited by him is published by Lexicon Books, and he has published many monographs and articles. His most recent publications are The Jewish Encounter with Hinduism, Wisdom, Spirituality, Identity, and the Same God, Other God, uh, sorry, and the Same God, and Other God, Judaism, Hinduism, and the Problem of Idolatry, both published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2015. And I, and today, I think, we'll hear less about Hinduism and perhaps more about <coughs> Judaism and the other. Please. It's the first time I have the privilege of giving a sermon at a university. What singles out a sermon from a talk? Sermon is our way of commenting on scripture. We never offer a sermon in thin air. We offer a sermon always somehow as a comment, as a reflection on scripture. And therefore, when I was invited to give this sermon, I asked myself, so what is the scripture that I would want to comment on in talking about the other? And I have chosen two verses that I would like to take time to reflect upon, tease out, and think about what they mean, not only to me, but what they would mean to you. Because a sermon, is not simply about giving ideas. A sermon is about touching people, asking them to internalize what is being said, reaching not only their hearts, rather, not only their minds, but also their hearts. I've handed out just now a series of texts in Hebrew, but I'll be delivering these texts uh, spontaneously in English, so pardon my, my translations, but I thought probably most of the people in the room speak Hebrew and it would be more beneficial for them to follow this in Hebrew. So. The two texts that I offer, and one of them was quoted just now by the Cardinal, have to do with the notion of love. Underlying this way of putting together my thoughts is the recognition that the highest form of treating the other is love. And therefore we would want to ask, how do we practice love, when do we practice love, and what are the obstacles to practice love? 
And I therefore would like to juxtapose two verses. The one in Leviticus 19. Love your, and here there's a question of translation. The cardinal just quoted neighbor. It could be neighbor, it could be friend. Reacha, as yourself, I am the Lord. And the other is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Two commandments, both beginning with the same command form, love, ve'afta. And I'd like to take, before launching into a series of readings, this is a sermon after all, take a moment and ask each one of you, if you want, close your eyes. If not, do this exercise with eyes opened. When you hear the words, ve'afta l'reacha kamocha, love your neighbor, love your friend, who do you think of as the friend? Check, check in with yourself. When you say, re'acha, are you thinking of your next door neighbor, Jewish people, the world, the cosmos? Sit with that answer for a second. Who is this re'acha that you, we, 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 we band this verse about so much we sometimes don't think, what does it really mean to us? When we say, ve'afta l'reacha, who do we mean? Is it specific? Is it unlimited? Now look at the second verse. Love the Lord your God. Is this coextensive with the first? How do they relate to one another? When you say, where do you feel this? Is he way out there? Is he deep in here? Is he with everyone? Is he only with a close one? Each one of us has some kind of an implicit approach to this. Somehow, we don't even know it. So subconsciously, we're already working with certain parameters, sometimes with certain boundaries. So try to give, take stock for a moment what the starting point in this sermon is in terms of how you relate to this notion of love to the other and love to God. And we'll check in again at the end. We'll see, have, have these texts, has this sermon, has my facilitation, has it been helpful to you in advancing in your thinking? So I want to walk you through a series of texts just about all of them, I think, most of them, not all of them, are drawn from the Kabbalistic or the mystical Jewish tradition. And these texts play out, these verses, or they tease out the meaning of what it, who the other is. So we'll be reading together and thinking together, and in the process, we keep thinking, so what do we really mean? Who is this other? And therefore, how do we love them? And therefore, is the attitude to the other one of love or something else? So I want to begin with uh, the Shla Kadosh, Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz, a 17th century figure, important popularizer of Kabbalistic literature. And he makes explicit the following. I'll read it to you in English, you can follow in Hebrew. It's written, love the Lord your God. It's written, love your neighbor as yourself. These two loves are united, and they are united through God's union, God's unity. Because this is how we finish our prayer in the morning when we say the benedictions of Shema, before we actually recite the Shema, we say, the one who chose his people Israel in love. And following that, we affirm the unity of God. And following that, we affirm love your God. So the unity of God, he says, if you follow the sequence of the liturgy, there's affirmation of the love of Israel, unity of God, love of the other. So the unity of God provides the glue that connects these two loves. So here's the assumption. Love of God, love of the other are tied together. And what ties them together is divine unity. A point that's then noted further along, the connection between the two, when he points out, and this is part of how Kabbalists reason, you count letters of words. There's a meaning to the number of letters that a verse has. So the verse, Ve'aftait Adonai Elohecha, love the Lord your God, has 14 letters. Ve'aftal Recha Kamocha similarly has 14 letters. So you count the two, you get equivalence not only in content, you get equivalence also in form. So what does it mean that these two are connected? Well, now you get into all kinds of open possibilities. If this were a classroom, I'd stop and ask you, but it's a sermon, so I'm going to tell you. What does it mean? What are the possibilities? So really, it could work both ways, right? We could say that the love of God is the basis for the love of the other. Only if you love God can you really love the other, or the other way around. 
when you love the other that opens you to the love of God. Quick show of hands. Who relates better to the idea that the love of God prepares the way for the love of the other? You're too academic. Again, who relates better to the idea that love of God prepares the way for love of the other? No one. Okay. Who relates better to the idea that love of the other prepares the way to the love of God? One person. No, I have a few more hands. Okay. So, if people are comfortable answering, the answer they seem to prefer is that the love of the other prepares the way for the love of God. What does the Shla say? So look, he actually gives in this discourse two different answers. The one, the love, love your neighbor as yourself, is the foundation that the world stands above, and it leads to loving the Lord. In other words, we learn how to love by loving each other, and by loving each other, we come to love God. But then later on in the discourse, he gives the opposite answer. Love the Lord your God is the foundation for loving the other. Whoever fulfills this, fulfills this, the other. Because when the love and union with God is upon him, he is called in God's name, and I see the quotation here is missing, but the, I'm sorry, I, I, I did a bad job cutting and pasting, but the idea is that when you love God, that empowers you to love others. I want to stay with this idea because it's going to come up several times as, as, we, as we progress through these texts. And I, what I'd actually like to suggest to you is the fact that despite that for most of you it seems counterintuitive that the love of God leads to the love of the other, actually that is the path. In other words, where humanly we may think that the love of the other leads to the love of God, in fact, if we want to overcome some of the limitations that we impose place upon love of the other, who the other is, where we, where we don't love the other enough, the answer is very often the love of God. Let's see how that unfolds. Okay, let's move to a second question. Who this other is? Now this is of course a question that's also dealt with in the New Testament. Who is this other? And Jesus here has a lot to say on that, because Jesus actually stretches the notion of the other to its limits. For Jesus, it's the understanding is that rather than a limited understanding of loving the other only as the one who is like you within your community, it's loving of everyone, and the big novelty, even loving the enemies. In the history of Jewish interpretation, loving the other, this verse, is best described through a notion of elasticity, gemishut. It can sometimes be narrower, it can sometimes be wider. And the interesting dynamic is to trace when are the uses of love narrow? When do they only apply to the one who is like me, to the one who's part of my community? And when does the notion of love expand and what makes it all-inclusive? And you already are beginning to follow my thinking when I say that it's God and the love of God that allows us to open from a narrow application of who the other is to a more broad and expansive application of who the other is. So let me share with you a collection of commentaries found in uh, one of the editions of the Mikraot Gdolot, Chumash Rav Pninim. It's a text called Likutei Anshei Shem, which is a commentary on this particular verse. And he brings there several commentaries that are relevant, and they're, they're, they're symptomatic of the history of interpretation. So, the first commentary, the word love your brother as yourself, kamocha, relates to the word l'reacha, because the word Kamocha can be either ahavta kamocha or l'reacha kamocha. Either love like you would want to be loved or to the friend who is like yourself. So the kamocha can qualify both words. So what does it qualify? He says, no, it qualifies the word reacha. So who is the rea? Who is the friend who is like you? The friend who is like you. In other words, he is like you and he fulfills the commandments like you. Because love applies only in relation to those who are similar and equal. So understanding number one. We love the ones who are like us, the in-group. Is this a human psychological principle or is this a spiritual principle? There's a human psychological principle. We tend to, to love our nation. We tend to love our group. We love our soccer team. I'm from Jerusalem. We have Beitar Yerushalayim. Right? So you love, you love the group that is closest to you. But the answer is not we love our people because they're our people. The reason is because they fulfill the commandments. So does that mean that love has to be earned? Is love only earned because you 
fit the minimal criteria that justify your being loved, and those criteria are fulfillment of the commandments, and if you don't fulfill the commandments, you're not worthy of love. So has a natural group psychology instinct been somehow transformed and justified into a spiritual principle of loving the other only on religious grounds? Now here, this is, this is I think, one of the biggest uh, minds, mokshim, that we, have to, that we have to unpack when we deal with the problem of loving the other. Because much of Jewish history in relation to the other, both within Judaism and outside Judaism, is contingent on he is like me, he meets the basic criteria of following the commandments, achicha reacha b'mitzvot, and therefore he is worthy of love, and the other is not worthy of love. And if we want to consider who the other is, this question, is the other the one of the in-group or the one who is beyond the in-group, will be the key issue to deal with. So here you see one default position. Let's move to the second text. Oh, I'm sorry, that text continued. He continues the, the proof for loving only the people who are like you, citing Psalms 119. I'm a friend to all those who fear you. So only those who fear you do I, do I uh, uh, am I friends to. Not to the wicked ones, the murderers, the robbers, those who destroy the world. Those it is best to, ha to hate or to harm. So there's a clear division. Now he actually doesn't draw the line by Jew, non-Jew, but by moral, non-moral. I love those who are moral, I hate those who are immoral. Or Yomar, or second interpretation. A person should love his neighbor or friend and seek to do good to him as much as he can and avoid harming him because he is your friend like you. What does it mean like you? He was created in the image of God. Now, again, Cardinal noted earlier the notion of the image of God in his presentation. So suddenly we have a new notion, an objective notion. The objective notion is the image of God, not because of what he does, but because the appeal to God, going beyond the human dimension into the divine dimension to justify the love of the other. So he was created in the image of God, and therefore this divine reality is the basis of love. And this is potentially much more expansive, right? Because anybody has the image of God, unless you have an idea that they've lost it. And then he goes on to cite Malachi, we, only have, we all have one father, which is a great verse for interfaith context. So often we've all heard in an interfaith gathering the statement, we all have one father. This quote from Malachi is one of those tropes. But interesting, he then reads it, this is Abraham, because obviously he heard the cardinal's presentation, so he knew we should talk about Abraham. This is Abraham, but here for him, Abraham is the father of all of Israel. So there's a tension in this text. Tension between image of God more expansive, Abraham more limiting. So, image of God, Abraham. Well, this tension is resolved in the next text, where it says, this includes loving all of mankind, be they whatever people they are, because he is a person created in the image and likeness like you. And he cites the third chapter of the Chapters of the Father, a teaching of Rabbi Akiva. Beloved is man who was created in the image of God. And it's clear from the context, as he argues, but I skipped that, that later on in that Mishnah, there's reference to Israel. And therefore, if man is beloved, it's not only the Jewish person, it's every person who is beloved. So now, love is universal. And what makes love universal is the divine principle that's made manifest in the image of God. So included in the love of the other is every person who, the Hebrew says, who contributes to the sustenance, to the establishment of society, who has, plays a constructive role rather than a destructive role in society. And this is why he said love, this is why he didn't say love your brother. Had he said love your brother, it would have meant only Israel. But he says to your friend, Every person, even a non-Jew. So we have here an understanding as part of the elasticity of the notion of the love of God that loving the other, loving re'acha, includes the non-Jew, not because he fulfills the mitzvot, 
There has to be some justification, you see. So if it's not the justification of the mitzvot, there has to be another principle. What's the other principle? The image of God. So the image of God offers everyone the basis, the foundation, the status upon which they are worthy of love. And then he brings a couple of other texts. Um, Sefer Haridim, a 16th century author in Safed, reads another, chap another saying in the chapters of the fathers, do not have contempt for any person. What does it mean not to have contempt for any person? It doesn't say for a Jew, any person, right? Great, small, Jewish, non-Jewish. So here we have a notion of respect. That's not exactly the notion of love, but he ties love and respect. And then finally, the celebrated disciple of the Ari, Rabbi Chaim Vital in Sharei Kedusha, is cited saying, love every person, including the non-Jew. So here we have the expansive notion of love, expansive because it's grounded in a divine principle. Let me move on to the next text. The next text is an 18th century text, a Hasidic classic, uh, by an author called Menachem Nachum of Chernobyl. He was a disciple both of the Baal Shem Tov and of the Magid of Mezlich. And in order to understand the context for this particular teaching, we realize that there's a tradition that's brought in the name of the Ari, Rabbi Isaac Luria, that before prayers we say, I accept upon myself the commandment of Ve'aftal Re'acha Kamocha. There's something intangible about Ve'aftal Re'acha Kamocha, right? Well, how do you fulfill it? So one way of fulfilling it is by intention. And interestingly enough, before going into prayer, you affirm, I'm not praying on my own. I'm not doing this as something that's only me, but in a totality of love, and the Biblical expression for this totality of love is So this is a custom that's performed down to this very day by many people, including yours truly. So here he interprets what does it mean to why we would want to affirm before we enter prayer. So he says like this. Before prayer, we say, I accept upon myself the commandment of loving your neighbor as yourself. Because everything is a total unity. Before I read on, I want to stop here and reflect on this. Everything is a total unity. What does otherness mean? Otherness means there's me and there's someone else. There's us and there's the other. Unity undermines that. If you really affirm unity, there is no me and other. We're all one. So the best way to overcome the problem of otherness is to discover the deeper unity that underlies everything. So unity is the deep key for overcoming otherness and for affirming the greatest love. How far does this unity extend? So you could say this unity extends within my community or within my people, or maybe it's even cosmic. All of being is one. There are some interpretations that read this declaration of love prior to reciting the prayers as connecting yourself with the entire cosmos so that you're united with the entire cosmos as an act of love. So what does the Me'orinaim say? He says like this, everything is unity and just like the Torah is called Torah when all the letters come together, so it is, I fill in the logic with people, they all have to come together. Now there's a wonderful teaching here. And then a difficult part. What does it mean that there's unity? What does that mean? He says, if you see something negative in your friend, you should only hate the evil in him, but love the holy in him. In other words, the other one is basically good, but there's some accretion, something additional that's come there, which is evil. We have to hate the evil, because we can't love something that's evil, but don't hate the person, only hate the part of him that's evil. Now, because there's unity, he brings here a wonderful teaching of the Baal Shem Tov. Baal Shem Tov says like this, a person who's righteous, Tzadik Gamur, does not see evil in anyone. A person who's righteous only sees good. You don't see any evil. If you see evil in someone else, it's like looking in the mirror. What is it that made it possible for you to see evil in the other? Why did you see the bad in the other? Because it's in you. You have it, you see the other. God presents it to you as an opportunity to examine yourself. He shows you something 
unsavory, that thing is in you. So you're always finding the good in the other and recognizing that the other is a mirror for the evil in you rather than projecting the evil onto the other. Well, if you live that way, then you're always affirming the deeper unity, using love as the key, and using the other as a teacher to purify yourself. In the same way that you'd never hate yourself for the evil in you, you would then never hate the other. Because everything is one. And the reason is again divine. His friend also has a divine in him. So the divine is the source of unity. Uncovery of the deeper unity in the divine is the foundation of love. Now comes the bad part. Bad from my perspective, not from his perspective, but bad from the perspective of the nice meeting we're having here where we're being friendly to one another. So here he brings in, and this is the question, what is the limit of unity? Where does unity stop? We saw in the previous text that the other who is like you should also be the non-Jew. So do we also affirm this unity with the non-Jew? Why not, you ask? Right? If everything is one and everything is divine and man was created in the image of God, that unity should extend not only to Jews, unity should extend to others. But much, most of Kabbalistic metaphysics is actually dualistic in a certain way. And it draws the distinction between the good and evil, especially along the lines of Jews and non-Jews and especially through the teachings of the Zohar that then become replicated in later generations, the non-Jews are associated with the wicked side, with the evil side, and the Jews with the good side. So we'll talk about how to deal with that in just a second. But here is how he's concluding. And I think it's important for us not to only bring out the nice stuff, but also to look at the difficult parts of our tradition, how they challenge us, and what they invite us to think about. So after this great affirmation of unity, we actually find a very radical kind of dualistic conclusion to this quote. He says, the nations of the world, their soul comes from the evil side. Therefore, the speech is also evil because most of what they talk about is fornication and cursing and other negative talk. So there's a kind of um, reliance on, on, on reality, a kind of phenomenology of the other that makes you see the other as negative and project that in metaphysical terms. And then rather than affirming the metaphysical unity, which would lead to love, you affirm the metaphysical disunity and then you keep the love contained. So then the love only extends to those whom you see as part of the divine. Why would people think that way? Isn't the natural instinct to recognize God in everything? Isn't the natural instinct, if you affirm divine unity, to recognize divine unity in all? So Cardinal spoke about historical circumstances. Maybe, maybe we just need to acknowledge that some of these texts were authored under historical conditions of great tension, persecution, competition, forced conversion, and you can't expect people who live in those circumstances to come up with a theology, well, no problem, we're all one, we love you ever less, never mind, even though you do this and the other to us. It's natural that what's happening in history should be projected into theology and in turn projected into metaphysics. I think we have to leave a lot of room for history, but then we also have to leave a lot of room for the question, what happens when history changes? And Dean Hames just told us that we're at a moment of historical change and the question is, how does this historical change invite us to rethink our theology and to rethink our metaphysics? To rethink who is the other we love and to think how expansive is our notion of unity and can it include the other who until yesterday some of our texts considered to be evil? This is our challenge. To do this, I now turn to the last author I'd like to share with you. And this is the early 20th century great man of God, Rabbi Abram Isaac Cook. Rabbi Cook was the first chief rabbi of then Palestine. A great mystic, a great lover of God, and a great lover of humankind. He grows out of the mystical tradition, but in this one particular aspect, 
he significantly transcends it. Where for authors like the Maori Naim and many other Hasidic authors who present us with a dualistic metaphysic, likely on historical grounds, that blocks our capacity to love. Rav Kook is so grounded in the reality of God, so grounded in the love of God, that his love of God extends to the farthest reach of what it means to love the other. And in the text I will conclude with, we have statements of intense love that cut across all boundaries, including everyone in a harmonious vision of love that is A, unitive, because ultimately love has to be based on this sense of unity, and B, grounded in the divine. And you can see from this reading that where we started earlier with a sense of does the love of the other lead to the love of God, or does the love of God lead to the love of the other, Rav Kook is a man whose divine love is so intense, works off this divine love to love all, going beyond the boundaries of everything the tradition knew before and making him maybe the strongest voice ever for the fullness of expression of love, overcoming otherness and affirming divine unity that thereby overcomes otherness and invites to love. So I want to conclude with these texts by Rav Kook. The love of all creatures precedes everything, then the love of man, then the love of Israel. So this is a kind of pyramid. First you love all creatures. This is back to this cosmic aspect. Uh, nowadays it's very much in vogue. This, uh, uh, I forget the word. Uh, you know, when you, when, you, when you relate to nature, what's, what's the word? Uh, uh, ecological. Uh, you know, e ecological perspective where you relate to the whole world. But in love, then all humanity and only the love of Israel. And the love of Israel includes everything because Israel will redeem everything. Israel have the responsibility towards everything. All these loves are practical loves, to love them, to do good, to seek their elevation. The love of God is higher because it is a love that doesn't necessarily draw a conclusion, but the heart is full of it and this is the greatest joy. So the love of God crowns all other loves, but it is also the foundation of all those other loves. So. This becomes a song of love where these different loves are unified into one reality, a hierarchical reality, a pyramidal reality, where at the top of the pyramid is the love of God that unites and brings it to, to, to fruition. Next greeting. The love of all creatures should be alive in the heart and in the soul. The love of every person and the love of all peoples. The desire for their elevation their restoration, physically and spiritually. So the basic principle is love must be alive for everyone and also for all the people. In other words, even those people who are our enemies. No, love must be the driving force. Hatred, right? We know that the flip side is hatred and hatred comes into expression in relation to the other. Hatred should only be addressed to the wickedness and to the evil that's in the world. One cannot attain the heights of spirit of the biblical verse, thank God, call his name, tell his deeds amongst the nations, so we can only praise God amongst the nations, if we have deep love from the depth of heart and soul to do good to all people, to improve everything they own, to make their lives happy. So you can't really serve, this is the reverse, you cannot serve God with the fullness of love, if you don't really love the others. So that it's kind of circle of love. The love of God leads to the love of the other, the love of other leads to the fullness of the love of God. And this is not a normal quality. This is a quality that adapts itself to the spirit of Messiah who would then dwell upon Israel. So there's a great answer here. He's not looking to the past. He's not looking to the wounds. He's not looking to what they did to us. He's not looking to the past. He's looking to the future. The future is Messiah, Messiah is love, it's a love that's unitive, and we, by looking to the future, we grow to the fullness of love, rather than looking to the past. Wherever we find indications of hate, we know that the intention is for the wickedness. It's only because of the wickedness that we hate, but not the people. Because that wickedness has a strong hold 
on the collectivity of people, even today, but especially in previous days when the world was more full of, of filth, of impurity. There's a notion of progress. Yeah, in, in a sense, there's an answer here to the historical question. Why do we find in our text so much negativity? Because that was the appropriate message then to where the world was, but the world has advanced. So there's a, a willingness to account for history as part of how we advance, and in that, to move from hatred to positivity. In parentheses, Rav Kook relies very heavily on the view of Meiri, of the others, and Meiri's view is based, as Moshe Halbertal has shown, on, on, on a notion of progress, and therefore Rav Kook also very much upholds this notion of pravik, end of academic footnote. But we must know that the point of light and holiness never left the image of God that humanity has received, and every nation and people have received. We're back to the image of God. The reason we love everyone and the source of unity, back to the image of God. And everyone, according to his measure, has this, has this seed of holiness. And from this point of life, of the recognition of the image of God in all, we desire the full elevation of the world. So image of God, unity, and praising God through all the people and their love. And then the last quote, the love of, love of others, the love of all, of all people, needs a lot of attention to expand it. When you say to expand, that's that notion of elasticity, right? Something that's narrow, you have to expand it. To expand it in the breadth that it deserves. Contrary to the superficial view that people have when they don't understand things spiritually in an adequate way, as though there's a kind of contrast between that love and what the Torah teaches us, or at least that the Torah is indifferent towards it. No, it has to fill all the rooms of the soul. The greatest position in the loving of the other has to be the love of man, and it must expand to all of humanity despite changes in faiths and beliefs. Okay, so there's an explicit statement here that love has to extend, extend also to other religions. That the other who has to be loved because ultimately he is one, being the image of God, and that the divine unity ties it all together, includes other religions as well. And despite all changes of races and, and, uh, and uh, aklimim, um, hmm? climates, simple climates, we must go to the depth of the character or the understanding of the different nations and people to learn as much as possible their attributes, their qualities, in order to know how to establish human love on practical foundations. So it's an amazing statement. Love isn't something you just declare. You want to love, be real. You want to be real, get to know the other. Study them, understand them. By learning them, and that means also learning other religions. By learning them, you understand what they are. By understanding who they are and knowing that they're not evil, you come to love them. So knowledge is the foundation of love, and knowledge reveals the deeper divine unity. Now, I have, I have to read this one phrase in Hebrew because it, it is just so, so soaring in its, in its vision. Kirak al nefesh ashira be'ahavat habriyot ve'ahavat adam tuchal ahavat haumalit nase bigon atziluta. Only a soul rich in the love of creatures and the love of man, only upon such a soul can the love of the people rise with all its nobility. We started saying that love is limited. You only love the people who are part of your people. Rav Cook says, no, you want to love your people? You have to have a total love. It's a pyramid. Love everyone. Only then will the love of your people be a noble love. Otherwise, it's just that psychological instinct we spoke about. You want it to be, be spiritual. You want it to be God-grounded. You must first love all in the fullness of love and only from then move to the love, to the love of, of your people. So my friends, we've gone on a journey and I've, we've looked at the different capacities of how to read who the friend is, how to read what love is, how to uncover unity. And let's conclude by going back to that moment of checking in. And I just want everyone to take a second and go back to that verse that we started with I started by inviting you to think, who is this Reacha? 
We've now seen so many different nuances and aspects. Look at it and think for yourself. Has my understanding of who Reacha is expanded in some way? Is it richer? Is it more expansive? If it is, then it's been worth this sharing with you. Thank you very much. Wow. Uh, thank you so much, Rabbi, Ol uh, Rabbi Alon Goshen Gottstein, for your uh, sermon. And actually, I think perhaps uh, um, after listening to you, that perhaps in academia, teaching in academia, we should perhaps sermonize, after listening to you both, we should perhaps sermonize more and uh, uh, we might be able to get our messages across in a, in a, uh, a better way. I love, I love the uh, uh, idea that um, if you see evil, right, you should take a look in the mirror. I think that's something that uh, uh, we can all, we can all uh, uh, learn from. Thank you so much. Thank you.